Good morning folks, Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. What I wanted to do today was I wanted to, again, going along with our basic series, but I, what I wanted to do was talk about knives and have a serious knife discussion today. I have recently been involved in quite a few discussions and visual things on knives, and I want to put this in the basic series so that people understand why I choose the types of knives that I choose, why I think that some knives are more favorable over other knives, and then also I want to talk to you about things that you see on the internet about different knives. And one thing that I want you to understand right off the bat is if you are watching a review of any piece of gear, it doesn't matter whether it is a knife or what it is, if you're watching a review, somebody saying, I'm going to review this piece of equipment, first of all, look at what condition the equipment's in. If it's brand new, chances are they've never used it. How can they review it? Number two, look at that person's overall skill level. Have you watched any of their other videos to see what their skill level is as a woodsman, as a bushcrafter, as a survivalist? And that would lead you to believe either, hey, this guy knows a little bit about what he's talking about, or maybe not so much. And that's what you need to understand. I see a lot of reviews on YouTube, and I don't watch many, because a lot of times I'd flat turn them off, I'll be honest with you. If I, if I pull up a video, let's just take a knife review, for instance. If I pull a knife review up on YouTube, and the knife looks brand new, I generally shut the video off. If it's laying on a table, and it's not in the woods, or the guy's not using it to do something with, and he's just talking about the knife, I generally turn it off. The other thing is, I look and see what the guy's skill level is while he's using that knife, if he's using it. And I will tell you now that if you take the crappiest Bud K knife on the planet, and you put a good sharp edge on it, and you take a nice Mora that costs 20 bucks, and you put a good edge on it, and you take any given knife that meets the criteria that we're going to talk about, and you sharpen that thing up, it doesn't matter if it costs three or $400. If you put all three of those knives in the hands of Morse Kahansky, he's going to make every one of them look like a knife you'd want to buy. Because his skill level and his expertise at fine carving and things like that are so precise and so good and so well honed, that he makes it look natural no matter what he's using to do it with. On the other hand, if you take that same set of knives and you put them in the hands of someone of lesser skill level, much less skill level, it doesn't matter how good the knife is, they're going to make that knife look bad. And it could look like something you don't want to buy, even if it might be something that's very good. So I want you to think about those things when you're looking at videos of knife reviews and things like that, because some of what we're going to do today is going to be talking about knives right in front of you. Some of it's going to be we're going to demonstrate some things with the knives, pros and cons of the different knives. One thing that you will never see me do with a knife, and it's another thing that I turn completely off as soon as I see it in a video, is you'll never see me take a five or six inch blade and chop with it. There's absolutely no reason to chop with a knife that's not meant for chopping. If you want a chopping knife, get a machete, get a Chris Kane survival tool, get a Golok, get a Parang, get a Kukari, get something that's made for chopping and processing wood, or vines, or bamboo, or whatever the case may be, but don't use a five, six inch knife to smack around and try to chop with and make excuses that the handle's not long enough or that you need to move it up and choke back and put a lanyard on it so you don't let go of it and get more leverage on the blade. That's bunk, okay? You should never have to chop with a knife that's not made to chop with. That knife should be used to baton through material or to push through material by using different types of cuts, not swung like some kind of an ax or a machete. If that's what you want, that's what you buy. That's the next thing that we need to talk about in this video is understand before you buy a knife, what is that knife going to do for me versus what do I want that knife to do for me? And I get a lot of questions from a lot of people about, you know, what's the best survival knife out there? Well, the patented answer to that is the one you have on you in a survival scenario. But that leads you right back to, that's probably the knife you bought to begin with, so did you buy the right knife? And when I look at that, what I want to tell you is, I look at any knife that I'm going to strap to my hip on a daily basis as a survival knife, because chances are, that's the knife I'm going to get stuck with in an emergency because I put it on my hip every single day and I'm not going to lose it. So with that said, I need to make sure that whatever knife I'm going to select to carry every day is going to be a knife that is multifunctional in an emergency scenario. It doesn't necessarily have to be a chopper because a big chopper is not going to be good at fine carving. 
It doesn't necessarily have to be great at fine carving because then it's not going to be very good for batoning or processing wood necessarily. It has to be capable of a lot of things. It has to be capable of processing game. It has to be capable of processing wood. It has to be capable of the fine carving, but it also has to be capable of making bigger logs, smaller pieces, so that you can create things like pencil-sized sticks from a four-inch log if you have to, or to split things out when you absolutely have to. So that knife has to do a lot of things for you and it has to cover a lot of bases. If you go back to my video on Knives of the Frontier or, you know, the kind of history of knives that have been used throughout time, you'll see that really the most common denominator is about a five to six inch blade, at least in the United States, about a five to six inch blade in some type of a butcher knife design, either a European butchering knife or an Americanized version of a butchering knife or a French version of a butchering knife. And those type blade designs lend themselves well to a lot of different things for the woodsman, that's why they used them. That's why they were around for two, three hundred years. That's the reason some of them are still made today. So understand what you want to do with that knife. If it's a backup knife that you're buying, you're going to put in your backpack, then maybe it doesn't have to be that perfect knife that's going to do everything. Maybe you're buying a backup knife only for, you know, the trap line that you're going to make your money cuts with, and you're going to keep that thing razor sharp, and it's going to be a perfect blade for you to make those precision cuts that you have to make, not to mess up a fur on an animal. Or maybe it's going to be your bush crafting knife that you're going to put in your in your pack pack, and you're going to keep that thing with you to do your fine carving and making feather sticks and doing all those little fancy things that we do in bushcraft. But does that lend itself to a good survival knife? Maybe yes, maybe no. Depends on if it meets the criteria that you decide it needs to meet. For me, I have certain criteria that I look at in a knife, and we'll talk about that right now. Okay, so let's get started on our knife discussion here a little bit. And let's talk about it. I've got a table or a bench of knives here. Basically, that are all knives that I have personally used over and over and over and over. None of these knives are brand new. All of these knives have been tested thoroughly in a wilderness environment for a lot of different tasks. So I can tell you, I feel confident that I can tell you what the pros and cons are of these type knives. Now, the first thing that you need to think about when you're selecting a knife is, Again, back to what is that knife going to do for me versus what do I want it to do for me. So for the sake of this discussion, because we're talking about basic concepts, let's talk about this is the knife I'm going to strap to my hip, and this is the knife that I'm probably going to end up with if everything goes bad, I lose all of my gear, that knife's going to be strapped to my hip and it's going to be my only tool that I have to use to affect my survivability. And there is a big difference between that and a bushcraft knife that you carry in your pack as a spare, or you put around your neck, or whatever the case may be. Totally against putting knives around my neck, but that's beside the point. Okay, so blade thickness. That is your first key element. To me, a knife that's going to be used for a multitude of tasks needs to be 3 16 of an inch thick at a minimum. I do carry knives, personally, that are only an eighth of an inch thick. This $3 butcher knife from a yard sale is only a little over an eighth of an inch thick and it's not quite three sixteenths. So if I had to measure it, you know it's right in between there, but it doesn't quite meet my minimum standard. Although I've used this knife for everything under the sun, so I'm pretty confident that in its ability to sustain me if needs be. This butcher knife is three sixteenths. This is the Habilis Pathfinder butcher knife. It's three sixteenths. So three sixteenths is a good thickness to start out with. Now Let's talk about why not an eighth inch, okay? Because generally what you'll find is most knives will be an eighth inch, three sixteenths, and then quarter inch. An eighth inch knife is going to have a lot of flexibility in it if the metal is tempered correctly. And it may bend on you or snap on you depending on, again, the temper of the knife. I've never broken an old hickory butcher knife, and they're eighth of an inch thick. So an eighth of an inch knife can do the job for you, but it's not going to be near as rigid or good for prying if you have to do things like that as 3 16 So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. I would say my personal opinion is 3 16 for a beginning knife. If it's going to be the one knife that you buy to keep on your hip, and this is where you're going to put all your eggs. Okay, And in my opinion, again, this is just my opinion, your knife should be your most expensive item in your kit for the most part, or you should have the majority of your budget set aside for your knife. Because that's what you're really going to stake your life on. And with that knife, you can do everything else if you have to, as long as you have the skill level. Now, remember, during this video, 
there's I'm not talking bad about any knife makers. I'm not talking bad about any people who review knives on TV on on uh, YouTube or use knives on TV. All I'm saying to you is these are my standards. These are the knives that I choose, and this is why you can make your own decision from what we're talking about. Once we get beyond the thickness of the blade, then we need to talk about the tang. Is a full tang absolutely necessary? In other words, is it one piece of solid metal that the scales are bolted to on both sides? Almost all of these knives, all of these knives are full tang. The knives I have over here are not. Again, I go back to if I'm going to get stuck with this one and I have no other tools, I may have to do things like prying hitting hard on the back of the spine with a baton of some sort to process firewood. All those types of things lend themselves to a weakness in a rat tail tang knife because it's smaller. It's not like that rat tail tang is the same thickness as the knife and three quarters of the way back to handle. Generally speaking, a rat tail tang knife is exactly that. It shrinks down to a rat tail and then goes back into the knife. So that is a weak point in the overall structure of that knife that could compromise you in a real emergency situation. So I choose, again, I choose to always carry a full tang knife on my hip, and that's my personal opinion. So all of these knives are full tang. Now a backup knife could definitely be a non-full tang knife, and most of my backup knives generally are non-full tang. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The next thing that I want to know on this knife is, and here again, this is the, these, some of these things are kind of go no-go for me. I can live with eighth inch if I have to, I'd rather have 3 16 but there's certain aspects of that knife that I can't live without or I'm not willing to do without. One of them is that that knife has a very sharp 90 degree spine on it so that it will effectively remove material from a ferrocerium rod. And there is a big misconception out there about ferrocerium rods and knives. Most of the time if you're having problems striking your ferro rod, it's not the rod, it's the knife. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple random knives here for you. I've got several different ferro rods from cheap $5 ferro rods all the way up to $50 ferro rods and we're going to strike them with a knife and you're going to see that for the most part they're the same. Okay, so what we got here is we have a variety of ferrocerium rods. This rod is just a cheap rod probably off of our website and the handle's been yanked off of it and it's been wrapped in duct tape to give me a good heavy duty handle. Most of the ferro rods that you're going to buy, and I say most, not all, most of the ferro rods you're going to buy, the handles are going to come off of them eventually, sooner or later anyway. So I just take mine off on these cheaper ones and I wrap them in duct tape so I've got an element of fire wrapped around it in an emergency. Plus I have this. This duct tape is for no other use except the handle or fire. I carry duct tape in my kit for other things. On this side I have a rod from canteenshop.com. Rob Simpson's ferro rod. I'm very fond of these. They're good ferro rods. They're a little bit more expensive. They're wrapped in leather. I think they come from Deepwood Handcraft. I'm not sure of that. And they're a very good ferro rod to stick inside your knife sheath if that's what you like to do. This is a cheapy, like a Coglins model ferrocerium rod. This is the Gobspark from firesteels.com. This rod is just a long blank ferro rod that was made by one of my instructors that has a copper butt end glued or epoxied on and pinned in that's filled with lead on the back side so that it can be used for a bopper for napping whether it's for your flint lock or whether it's for making arrowheads out of glass or flint whatever the case may be it also gives you a good handle to hold on to and a large striking surface to remove material into your tender bundle again cost difference is a lot here you're talking this one and this one are probably five bucks or less this one's around 2025 20, this one's around 2025 20, I believe these things are around 40 50 bucks so you've got a big difference there but the bigger the rod is the longer it's going to last a lot of guys ask me about those blocks of magnesium with a little bitty rod going across the top of them those things are useless in my opinion you're going to wear that rod out long before you ever get rid of that magnesium and most all of your ferrocerium rods have a heavy content of magnesium in them already that's going to burn if you can remove the material with your blade that's the important thing it's generally not the ferro rod that causes you the problems it's the blade okay I'm gonna use a couple of different knives to do this stuff with first one I'm gonna use is the Pathfinder knife this is 
made by Blind Horse Knives. It's called the PLSK-1. It's a Scandinavian grind, 3 16 of an inch. A little over a 5 inch blade. This one happens to have curly maple handles on it. Has a good sharp 90 degree spine. So let's try this one first on just a cheapy rod. Now that's just this cheapy $5 rod. Here's the cheapy one off my website. You can see it's removing enough material it's hanging up on the back of the knife even. Here is the gob spark. Okay. Canteenshop.com. Got to get the coating off of it. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you what just happened here. The cap just came off of this. The leather coil cap just came off of this. I've never seen that happen to one of these ferro rods before. But it goes right back to what I was telling you. Almost any ferro rod you buy, the cap is going to come off of it unless it's pinned through. It's going to come off. Just wrap it with tape and go on and don't worry about it. If you're looking for something fancy looking, do yourself a favor and make sure you got some duct tape with you when you get done. Here is the large ferro rod. Again, we've got to get the coating off of it. Once we get the coating off of it, it shouldn't take a whole lot of effort when you do this. If your knife has good 90 degree spine on it, it won't take much effort. So you can see that all of those ferro rods will work just fine with that knife. Okay, this is the Mora Bushcraft Black. We haven't talked about this knife yet. It's not a full tang knife. It is high carbon steel, which means it's going to rust if you don't take care of it, but it's going to be easier to sharpen in the field than stainless. I prefer a high carbon, and we'll talk about that in a little bit and why on our next exercise, but let's look at what this will do. And again, it has that good 90 degree spine. So let's start with our cheapy ferro rod here. Pretty good. The other cheapy ferro rod, pretty good. Gob spark, real good. The long heavy duty one, real good. The canteen shop, pretty good. Okay, so you can see that as long as we have a good 90 degree spine, it doesn't really matter whether the knife costs 30 or 40 bucks like this one or close to $300 like the Pathfinder knife. They're going to do what you need them to do with a ferro rod, and that's the important characteristic to understand. Will this knife be good for striking a ferrocerium rod? Every time I see someone take their knife and strike their ferrocerium rod with the blade of their knife, I know that person doesn't know what they're doing because I'm never going to sacrifice my knife blade to strike a ferro rod. I can always use the back of this or I can find something else if I can't do that, but I'm never going to sacrifice my blade. This area of your blade, from here to here, from this curve back, is going to do two-thirds of everything you do with this knife will take place right here. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. Okay, so that gives us a pretty good look at one of the things that we want our knife to be capable of, which is striking our ferrocerium rod. A ferrocerium rod, in my opinion, is the most reliable fire starting device you can possibly have in an emergency scenario. Matches are a one shot deal. Lighters run out of fluid and get wet. All of those types of things. You need to concentrate your efforts on understanding how to use a ferro rod with lots of different tenders because a ferro rod throws a very very hot spark that will light up a lot of tinder and it works even when it's wet. Get yourself as big a ferro rod as you can find that you can afford in the long run and carry that with you as your main ferrocerium rod. All right, moving on. The next thing that we want to look at is the steel that this knife is made out of. Everything that I do with this knife has to be a multifunctional deal. Obviously, I can do a lot of things with this knife as far as making other things, and that makes it multifunctional, but it also needs to be part of my kit as far as being useful for at least three things and I need to be able to start fire with this thing as one of those chores or duties of my knife and by scraping that ferrocerium rod that takes care of that element but I would also like for my knife to be able to throw sparks from a hard rock in case I were to lose my ferrocerium rod for some reason and all I'm left with is this knife if I can get a fire built somehow because I made a bow drill set with my knife 
I don't want to have to go through that hassle the second time. So if I can make char cloth in that first fire, thinking ahead to my next fire, and I can find a nice hard rock, I can use that to create an ember to then put in a bird nest and forego the whole bow drill action on the next fire. So I want this knife to be made out of high carbon steel so that it will throw sparks off of the spine with a hard rock. High carbon steels, 01 tool steel, 1095. Uh, a lot of the Condor knives are made out of a 1065, 1070. Not really enough carbon in them to throw a good spark. You see there's no Condor knives on this table. Not because I've never used one, but because it's not a knife that I would carry all of the time. So if you're going to ask me about other knives and you don't see it on this table, it's because I either haven't carried it, don't carry it, or I have carried it and don't like it and don't carry it anymore. These are the knives that I trust. Okay, so let's talk about striking sparks with the back of our knife. So again, what we're trying to accomplish here is turning our knife into an ignition source. And we can do that as long as we have that high carbon steel blade. So let's pick up, first of all, we'll just pick up this butcher knife. What I'm going to do with my knives when I decide I'm going to buy one is I'm going to do this first. If that thing's throwing sparks, I'm a happy camper. Now I know i got a good high carbon steel blade for sure, even if I have no idea what this thing's made out of. Yard sale, $3 butcher knife. Looks like carbon steel. It's rusting up. It's got some patina to it. Let me take a rock to it. Okay, now I'm in business. Does it have a good 90 degree spine on it? Yep, now I'm in double business. Is it the right thickness? It's pretty close. Has it got a good, nice 5 to 6 inch blade on it? Yep, okay, I want that knife. That's my factors. Now, any knife that you have that's high carbon steel, and we'll, in fact what we'll do is we'll get another cheaper type knife out here. We'll look at this Mora Bushcraft Black. Again, does it throw sparks? Yes, it does. Okay. Is it throwing them as good as the butcher knife? Not quite. But that could just be because the blade is like blued and not all of it's wore off yet. But I know this will start, it will create ignition with char cloth because I've done it. So if I have a high carbon steel blade, I'm going to be able to affect ignition that way. And I'll show you how to do that right now up close. Hang tight, guys. Okay, so I have a charring tin here that's got some char cloth in it right here. So we'll pull that piece of char cloth out, and that's what we're going to use for this demonstration. Now, if I'm trying to strike sparks with my knife, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can hold the knife blade like this and strike it against the rock, exactly like you would do a striker. But I don't like that method very well because I've got my knife blade toward my hand. If something were to slip, I could cut myself. If I have to wrap something around the blade, I may not get a good grip on it. So I would rather strike down on the blade to the charred material. So we'll pull a piece of this charred material off of here and lay it to the side real quick, just like this. And what I like to do is lay that thing out to get as much surface area exposed as I can to catch my sparks and then kind of tack it down with my knife, just like this. Then I'll lean my knife backwards just a little bit and I'll strike sparks onto the char cloth. Just like that. Okay. Put that out. Now let's look at the $3 butcher knife. We'll do the same thing. We'll get it out here. We'll pin it down with the blade. We'll hold on to the handle, push them down. Okay. We're on fire. All right. Now let's look at the Pathfinder Scout. Bigger than the Pathfinder PLSK1. Larger in blade size and blade length. This is a six inch blade. It's a little bit wider. This one has a full flat grind, but it does have that 90 degree spine. It is 3 16 It's just a little bigger, more of a French trade or butcher knife style design. All right. Get my sparks to go in the right spot here. There we go. Okay, 
we got a char cloth on fire. So, you can see that a $40 knife will do it, a $3 knife will do it, a $200 knife will do it. It doesn't matter how much the knife costs, it matters what the physical characteristics and capabilities are of that knife. Okay, so what I want to do now real quick is I want to kind to kind of go through some knives with you guys one at a time, show you knives that I trust. Doesn't mean that there's other knives on the market that aren't good, but again, if you're going to ask me what I think of this or that, if you didn't see it in this video, that should give you an indication of what I think about it. It means I don't carry it, all right? Anything by Blind Horse Knives is going to be bomb. Anything by Habilis Bush Tools is going to be a good knife. Anything by Moore is going to be a good knife, but it's not going to meet all of the criteria that we talked about. Some of them are not high carbon, they're stainless, and none of them are full tang. All right, so let's start off with the Moras. The Mora Bushcraft Black is by far my favorite. It's got a nice blue blade, it's got a three-quarter tang, nice comfortable rubber over plastic handle here, high carbon steel blade, good 90 degree spine, the blade on it's almost a little over four inches long. And for me, you know, the minimum is about five, but again, this is not going to be my main knife, so it doesn't have to be five inches. This is another Mora. This is the Mora Companion. Another good knife. About half, a little over tang, maybe three quarters. Rubber over plastic handle. You can see the blade's a little bit less robust than the Bushcraft Black. It's a little bit shorter. It's not, not as wide. And it's about the same, not quite the same thickness. So this is a heavier knife than this one, but this knife costs more than this one. Both of them will do the job. A knife I've been carrying a lot lately as a backup or carving type knife for bushcrafting is this Martini. And this was given to me by one of my instructors. Solid rubber handle, three quarter inch tang molded over. It's got a really nice 90 degree spine on it. It's good and thick. It's over eighth of an inch. It might be close to three sixteenths. Scandinavian grind. It's a very short blade. It's only a little, it's a little less than four inches, I think. So it's not going to be a main knife for me, but it is a great backup skinning, carving, and crafting knife for my pack. This is the Habilis Butcher Knife, and this knife was designed directly after this knife. This is a $3 butcher knife from a yard sale. This is the Habilis Butcher Knife. It was designed and made directly to mimic this knife because we knew there'd never be another one of these come along. So we wanted something that was very close to an 18th century design with 18th century type handle materials and scales. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six pins in it so that it's more period correct for something along the 18th century lines. Solid hardwood handles. They are flat, as many of them were back then. It does have the Pathfinder logo and the Habilis Bush Tool logo on it as well. It's a nice Scandi grind. It's Scandivex. It's got a little bit of a convex grind, compound grind at the bottom of the Scandinavian grind. It's got a good 90 degree spine on it and it's made out of 1095. So it definitely meets all the criteria. Definitely a good robust knife. Okay, now let's get to BHK, Blind Horse Knives. Now Blind Horse, obviously I've had a very, very long relationship with Blind Horse Knives. They're absolutely my favorite knife company, bar none in the world. Their knives have never failed me and everybody I've talked to says if they've ever had any issue with a knife, that Blind Horse has replaced it without question. So any guarantee like that is the guarantee I want. Their fit and finish is perfect. Their shop's really nice. I've been to their shop, so I know what it looks like. I know what the craftsmanship is. Good American-made quality, but again, you're gonna pay for American-made knives. This is the Pathfinder Scout. It's the one that I carry probably 95% of the time. Not because I don't like the PLSK1, but because this one has a little more versatility for what I do every day. If I were going to have to choose one knife for an emergency, it would be the PLSK-1. That's what it was designed for. This knife is more of a hunting, skinning, butchering type knife. It's got a big six inch butchering style blade on it. European type uh, French trade knife style blade. 3 16 heavy, heavy spine, 01 tool steel, curly maple handles. It's just a really, really nice heavy duty knife and I carry this one quite a bit. The PLSK-1 is the original Pathfinder knife that was made by Blind Horse Knives. Scandinavian grind, blade's about five and a quarter inches long. It's got some jimping on the top of the blade here, curly maple handles on this one. Like I said, 01 tool steel, 
heavy duty 90 degree spine this knife will do anything in the world that you want it to do and if you have it in if it's in the right hands of the person with the right skill it can do anything you want it to do from fine carving to processing firewood this is the muck the Nesmic with the Pathfinder logo on it that's made by Blind Horse Scandinavian ground Nesmic style blade and it's basically a short butcher knife and I think that's pretty much what Nesmic had in mind when he had this knife made if you look at this knife compared to a larger butcher knife they're pretty much the same it's just shorter and squattier than a butcher knife it's got that same hump at the top so that it rides high over bone when you're cutting with it it's good for batoning I like this dished area right here because that forces a lot of forces a lot of pressure right here to the belly where you're, when you're trying to split wood and things like that with it so it's a really really good knife uh, but remember with any knife you're going to about this much of your blade is where you're going to do 90 percent of your work you know the before you get to the upsweep on the belly is where you're going to do 90 percent of your work when i see guys carving sticks and they're making points on sticks out here on the blade i know those guys don't know what they're doing because that area of your knife should be the most pristine area because that's what you're going to use to process game. That's what you're going to use for very fine undercuts and notches and fine carving tasks. You don't want to use that for hogging material off to make points on sticks. That's what this area of the knife is for. Okay? Just a little tidbit there. The Nesmic knife's a really, really good all around hunting type knife. This is the Blind Horse Bushcrafter. Great Kephart style design blade. Kephart style really designed knife for the most part. It's got this inlet in the handle, which makes it really comfortable for your finger. It's got a nice round grip. As my instructor, Jer uh, Jamie Burley, always says, it's like a broom handle. doesn't matter how you hold it, it's always going to be comfortable in your hand. And that's kind of one of the pluses to this knife for bushcrafting and things like that. It's got a 4-inch blade on it. Like I said, it's got a Kephart design, spear point blade on it. This one happens to have a full flat grind. I think the ones they sell have a hollow grind. I'm not positive of that. Don't quote me on that. And this one happens to have curly maple handles. This is a really nice little knife that Blind Horse makes. This is the Woodsman Pro. Now, I've carried this knife not as extensive as I've carried the others, but it is a really nice woodsy style design knife for hunting and trapping and things like that. It's just not quite big enough for something to me to be beyond a carving knife or a skinning knife for a one tool type knife but it is a very good backup knife for the trap line for hunting for skinning and things like that yeah, and this is called the trap line companion now this knife has got about a four inch blade on this was an accidental knife this was a knife that was made another knife was messed up and this knife was ground out of it by dan at blind horse knives and when he showed it to me i fell in love with it and the reason i fell in love with it and decided to adopt it as the tlc is because it has a nice hollow grind which means it's going to stay razor sharp it's got a nice little drop point right here for skinning and making money cuts on furs and hides and things like that. And it has that small kitchen knife-like feel to it that makes it great for fine carving tasks and things like that. So for making feather sticks, for doing fine undercuts and notches and all those types of things, this thing is like the mora of the blind horse world except it's full tang and it's high carbon steel with a 90 degree spine so it does everything for me if it needs to. Okay, one thing I want to talk about real quick in this video is I see a lot of people talking about making feather sticks. How well does the knife make feather sticks? Well, it depends again on how well you can handle the knife and what your skill level is. A good sharp knife will make feather sticks. Obviously, a thinner blade is going to make better feather sticks than a thicker blade. So you have to understand the limitations of what you have. But even a blade that is 3 16 or thick like the Pathfinder knife which has got a big heavy Scandinavian grind on it which makes it really good for processing wood and things like that and a good heavy duty tool is not going to be as good for fine carving tasks as say this TLC or even this Martini or Amora because the blades are thinner they have a sharper Scandinavian bevel to them and they're going to make those fine cuts this one is hollow ground so it's definitely going to make fine cuts all right but let's look at these knives and when you're making feather sticks, you're not trying to, you don't want this thing hanging out on a stump between your legs and you're trying to push the knife with both hands. That's not the way to make feather sticks. Feather sticks are a fine finesse carving task.
tell you, nobody would complain about that feather stick. Okay? Out of a 3 16 inch blade with a heavy scanty grind on it. That is a nice feather stick. That will take flame very, very quickly. And that's the advantage of a feather stick is you have increased the surface area and made the material very thin so that it heats up quickly and combusts faster. Okay, guys. Well, I appreciate you joining me for this video out here today. Um, I wanted to go over my mentality with you or my line of thinking when it comes to knives. I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about understanding what you're looking at when you watch other people handling knives, using knives, reviewing knives, and things like that. And again, this is not a bash on any knife company. This is not a bash on any YouTube reviewer. I just want to educate the people who are watching my videos as to what you should be looking for. And be sure that when you watch a review on any product, whether it's a knife or a steel pot, that that person has used that item. And you can't say that you've used an item by taking it to the woods one time, or for five minutes, or five hours, or likely even five days. You need to use and abuse that item before you can really say what its worthiness is to have in someone's kit. I'm Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. I appreciate your views, your support, everything you do for me, for my school, for my family. I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.